I am going to change that constitution, the state constitution, that is. And that is the beginning topic of our lecture today. We're going to talk about state constitutions and how malleable they are. And by malleable, I mean readily changeable. When we look at the federal constitution, have there been changes? Well, yeah, they've been few and far between when it comes to actual amendments of the federal constitution. And as we look at why that is, you'll see it's in part because of the different way that the federal constitution is changed versus how a state constitution is changed. When we look at a state constitution, we've got to call that malleable. If you're a Floridian like I am, it's rare that you ever go to the ballot box and you don't see a proposed constitutional amendment to vote on. It seems almost every time a Floridian goes to the ballot box, the Floridian is asked to vote yes or no on a proposed amendment to Florida's constitution. We're going to look at why that is. We're going to look at how that is. And most importantly for you, my fellow lawyers, we're going to see how you might go about making changes to Florida's constitution. We're going to look at how state constitutions are changed and the specifics of how the constitution of the state of Florida has changed. But before we get to that, I thank you once again for the fact that you've indulged me and allowed me to start every class with a prayer. I'll do that once again. As always, I'm not praying at you. I am praying for you. I'm praying for your success in this class. I'm praying for your success in whatever bar exam you might take, whether it's the Florida bar exam or any other. And I'm praying for your success as an attorney, as a lawyer, as the guardian of the rights of your clients. So with all that said, as always, I pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by that confidence, I flee unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To you do I come before you, I stand sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in your mercy, hear and answer them. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So amending a state's constitution versus amending the federal constitution. As we begin our chapter, that is where our chapter begins. So I will begin there also. According to the Nova Law Review article that I quote at the beginning of our chapter, quote, unlike the federal constitution, Florida's constitution is constantly being amended. And as I mentioned, if you're a fellow Floridian who goes to the ballot box, how could you disagree? At least in modern times, it seems there are always amendments to vote upon. To learn how to amend the American Constitution, we look to the plain language of the Constitution of the United States itself. We're looking at Article 5 of the Federal Constitution. The Congress, where the two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three fourths of the several states or by conventions in three fourths thereof as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by Congress, provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article and that no state without its consent 
shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. Quoting there from Article 5 of the Federal Constitution. Does that sound like a burdensome means by which one might amend a constitution? Most scholars agree that it is. And maybe in our own personal experience, we can see that it is. In your lifetime, how many amendments have you seen being proposed and passed when it comes to the federal constitution? In my lifetime, the number is zero. Maybe that's the same count for your lifetime too. But what about state constitutions? In any given year, is there a state constitution that goes unamended? I don't have the exact statistics, but I'm tempted to say that there is not. Here in Florida, it seems an oddity that a year might go by without an amendment to Florida's constitution. Indeed, when we look at the length of constitutions, relatively speaking, state constitutions are far longer in words, in paragraphs, and in pages than the federal constitution. Could that be in part because state constitutions are so more readily amended than our federal constitution could be? Some scholars suggest that is indeed the reason. So let's take a closer look at exactly how a state's constitution is amended. And of course, this being a Florida constitutional law class, I will focus on the great state of this Florida, but I will not neglect the overall picture of how state constitutions in general are amended. First, when it comes to amending a state's constitution, the rules for how that state's constitution is amended appear within the text of the state's constitution. So yet again, I urge you to read the text of the constitution. Indeed, here in my class, the text of Florida's constitution is on the syllabus. So please do not dare take my final exam without having finished reading the entire constitution of the state of Florida. And if your federal con law professor didn't urge you to do the same about the federal constitution, then shame on her or him. Take the time to read that too. Please don't go forth and call yourself a lawyer in this great nation without having read these documents. If you were at the red mass with me on Thursday, you with the chief judge on the altar rose your hand, raised your hand and took again the oath of attorney where you swore to uphold both the constitution of the United States and the constitution of the state of Florida. Can you seriously take that oath without having read both documents? So please, before you're sworn in, make sure that you've done that. And of course, before you take my final exam, if you dare not do that, you're in big trouble when it comes to grading time. So let's read those documents and know that when it comes to amending a state's constitution, the rules for how to amend it appear within the text of the state's constitution itself. That is true of all states and is certainly true of the state of Florida. Here you will look at Article 11 of Florida's constitution. Remember the U.S. Constitution, the Constitution of the United States, it was Article 5 that told us but here in the Constitution of the state of Florida, we're looking at Article 11, which I don't know how to hold up 11 fingers. I'm gonna put my foot up, there you go. 11, did you know I could kick that high? I didn't know either and apparently either did my thigh muscle. <laughs> but I'm still standing, so that's a good thing. <laughs> the second point I wish to make about amending a state's constitution is that state legislatures typically have a role in amending the state's constitution. Now, as I read part of Article 5 of the federal constitution out loud to you, you saw the role of our federal legislature. Specifically, you saw the role of the US Congress. Almost invariably, state legislatures can and do have a role in how state constitutions are amended. And that is true to a certain extent here in the state of Florida because a proposal can arise from the Florida legislature. The Florida legislature, if both houses, the Florida House and the Florida Senate, pass that same proposal by a super majority of three fifths, then what becomes of that 
that becomes a proposal for an amendment to Florida's constitution. Does that mean the constitution is amended once a successful three-fifths vote occurs in both the Florida House of Representatives and the Florida Senate on a verbatim exact same amendment? No, but it means that a proposal to amend Florida's constitution exists. What becomes of this proposal? Keep that question in mind. I will give you the answer in just a moment because there is more than one way such a proposal might exist. That brings me to my third point. Here in Florida, there are commissions that meet on a scheduled basis for the purpose of potentially proposing amendments to Florida's constitution. Now in Florida history, has there been a meeting of such a commission where they decided, ah, no need, no need, no proposals, no amendments, no need? No, historically that's not happened. And maybe if there's a flaw in these commissions, maybe that is the flaw. We assemble these folks, many of whom are volunteers to take a look at proposals. Who would volunteer? People who think there's a need for proposal, right? Even those who weren't volunteers, who were assigned to the commission by Florida's constitution, they're spending all this time. They don't want to waste their time. It's just human nature, right? So maybe that explains why there are proposals that almost invariably come out of Florida's commissions. Perhaps that also explains why Florida's rules of court procedure are constantly in flux, many of which, such as the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure, are on a, are on a two-year cycle where every two years a group is supposed to propose changes. And almost invariably they do. And I tell you, even if you leave law school knowing like the back of your hand, the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure, I urge you to open them up every time you need them because they're being changed so rapidly. Likewise with these commissions. These commissions get together and almost invariably they find the need for an amendment. We've got a constitutional revision commission we also have a Taxation and Budget Reform Commission. Article 11 of Florida's Constitution tells us how to convene and when to convene such a commission, which is scheduled right there in the Constitution. Some members of Florida's Politburo, of Florida's elected officials, are automatically on the commission. Others are nominated or recruited from various groups, such as the legislature, the executive, or the judicial branches of Florida. All the details are right there in Florida's constitution and these groups can get together. They can make internal rules for themselves and then following those internal rules, will call up for a vote, whatever proposals they feel are appropriate to change the constitution and they'll draft that proposed change. What becomes? of those successful changes according to the internal voting procedures of that commission, those two become a proposal. Just because the commission voted affirmatively and followed its own rules, that doesn't mean we have a change to Florida's constitution. What it again means is that we have a proposal, just like if Florida's legislature had done the work instead of one of these constitutional commissions. And that again begs the question, McGinley, what becomes of this proposal? Hate to keep teasing you to keep listening, but that answer is still forthcoming. Before I get there, there's yet another way that proposals can arise. When we're talking about states in general, and we're talking about amending a state's constitution, voter initiatives are almost invariably a means by which the state constitution is amended. Is that good? Is that bad? Well, you know, I'm here to teach what the law is. I'll let you decide which parts of the law are good, or which parts of the law are bad. But some say that it's these voter initiatives that give state constitutional law a bad name. Because unlike the lofty federal constitutional law, where we're always dealing with lofty issues, Sometimes voters, through their initiatives, can put something that looks rather mundane on a state constitution. For example, a bullet train between Orlando and Miami. 
Should there be high-speed rail between Orlando and Miami? Well, that's probably not the kind of topic you'd find in the federal constitution of the United States, right? But do you find it in the state constitution of the state of Florida? You betcha. You find it put and removed and put. Historically, there was an amendment that said there must, not that there can or that there should, but that there must be a bullet train, high-speed rail between Orlando and Miami. Mm -hmm. A few years thereafter, there was an amendment to Florida's constitution that says there cannot, not that there should or there shouldn't, but there cannot be a bullet train or high-speed rail between Orlando and Miami. And a few years thereafter, constitution was amended again. So now it's allowed and indeed it's being built. Is that too mundane for a federal constitution? Well, maybe so. But look at the flip side, which is the side I see. Instead of voter initiative, giving state constitutional law a bad name, maybe voter initiative is that last bastion of true democracy. The people can rise up, not even needing the cooperation of their elected officials, certainly not needing any judicial intervention, and can by themselves draft their own amendment, which then is part of the constitution of the state, and is a binding law, regardless of what the judiciary might have preferred, regardless of what the elected Florida senators and Florida House of Representative representatives might have preferred. The people themselves can literally take a pen, or I guess nowadays a laptop, type, 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 and write a law and enact it and put it on the books. That's direct democracy in its truest form, is it not? So maybe instead of voter initiative giving state constitutional law a bad name, maybe it should be giving state constitutional law a good name. I guess when it comes to someone who doesn't want to read a lot of pages on a constitution, maybe that gives it a bad name. Because we can't control what the public might write when it comes to an amendment. Maybe instead of a sentence or two, maybe they'll write three or four paragraphs. Maybe they'll write eight or 12 pages. Maybe before you know it, you got a 600-page state constitution. These things happen. But on the flip side, if that's what the people want, then isn't it what the people should have in our great republic here in the United States? Again, I'll let you decide whether it's good or it's bad. I'll just point out that almost invariably when it comes to state constitutions, voter initiative is one means by which the state constitution can be amended. And that is certainly true here in Florida. When it comes to a voter initiative, there are certain requirements. It has to be a single subject. That's not true for these commissions. They can, uh, what's, what's the term that the monopolies use? A bundle, right? I can't get cable TV without also getting voice over IP telephone or without also getting high, uh, a modem, without also getting internet because that darn cable company monopolies got them all bundled together, right? And indeed, a constitutional commission can do that here in Florida. They can bundle together totally unrelated things and put them on the ballot. And you got to vote yes or no. Maybe you in the four issue bundle, maybe you like three out of four issues, but you really would have voted against one of those issues. You can't take your pen and start crossing out on the ballot. Yes for this one, no for that one. You got to say yes or no to the commission's bundle. Voter initiative works differently. That single subject rule that we studied earlier in this semester when we talked about lawmaking and its limits, that applies to a proposal that arises from a Florida voter initiative. Single subject rule does not apply to an initiative uh, proposal that comes from one of these constitutional commissions, but it does apply if you and I as ordinary citizens draft the proposal. Voter initiatives have to have a single subject. If it passes, then that voter initiative passes by going door to door, pounding the pavement, getting signatures. You've got to get enough signatures. You'll need 8%. You've got to get enough signatures from the population. And that's how a voter initiative, so to speak, passes. But when I say passes, what I mean, as always, is that the Constitution of the state of Florida has not yet been amended, but there is a proposal for an amendment. 
So if we've got the voter initiative, the single subject, the 8% on the signatures, we've got a proposal. McGinley, come on, man. What becomes of this proposal? I'm going to get there. Stay with me now. I'm going to get there because there's yet another means of changing the Constitution that I want to cover first. And this, again, speaks generally of state constitutions in general. In general, if you don't like your state's constitution as is, in general, the people of that state can literally and figuratively tear up the existing constitution, draft a whole new one, and replace the old existing constitution with that brand new document. This is done through a constitutional convention. And of course, the most famous of which was 1789 when it came to the federal constitution. But this can happen on a state level, too. Has it ever happened in the state of Florida? Well, it was before my lifetime. The year was 1968. I wasn't around in the 60s. I guess it was a time of bell bottoms, free love, and terrible music. But it was also a time that Floridians tore up their constitution in 1968 and replaced it with a new one because there was a constitutional convention. What becomes of a successful new document arising out of a constitutional convention? If the constitutional convention says yes, does that mean Florida's constitution is already torn up? No. What it means instead is that there is a proposal, which brings me back to that lurking unanswered question. McGinley, what becomes of all these proposals? So whether it was the Florida legislature that did its work and created a proposal, whether it's one or the other of the commissions created under the Florida Constitution that created the proposal, whether it was a voter initiative, whether it was a constitutional convention, regardless of the source of the proposed amendment, regardless of the source of the proposal, it either becomes the new language of Florida's constitution or not the exact same way by you and I, Florida's residents who are voters going to the ballot box and voting yes or no. So regardless of the source, that's how it gets on the ballot. There is however, the chance that even though the proposal was proposed and arose, that it might not get on the ballot because the Supreme Court of the state of Florida says that it has the authority to prevent it being on the ballot. Indeed, case law tells us, and we'll cover it in a little more detail in a few moments, that there are certain requirements for getting on the ballot, including how the ballot summary reads. In its most basic requirements, a vote of yes has to mean that this becomes part of Florida's constitution and a vote of no means that it does not. But the requirements can be more than that and we'll cover those in greater detail. Assuming Florida Supreme Court does not prevent Florida's voters for voting on the proposal. Then before the election, that proposal's got to run not once but twice in a newspaper in each Florida county. <clears throat> I don't know, maybe these folks never heard of the internet. I don't know, but it's a newspaper requirement. It's got to run in the newspaper. Each county has at least one paper of general circulation recognized under state law, and you got to run it in a newspaper of general circulation in each Florida county. Assuming that happens and everybody goes to the ballot box in Florida because it ran properly and it was a proper proposal and the Florida Supreme Court didn't stop it from getting before the voters then what we need is more than just a majority, not just 51%, but 60% have to vote to approve it. 
So we need 60%. If it gets 60%, then when is that amendment effective? When does it apply? When can it be said to be part and parcel of Florida's constitution? Well, if the amendment was drafted in such a way to state an effective date, then that is the date that it is effective. If it doesn't state an effective date, then it will be effective on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in the first January after the election, which I feel silly even pointing out because obviously you knew that, right? Yeah. Where to come up with that? I don't know, just memorize it. Which is the same way I handle the tax law, right? You know, well, why is this the tax law? I don't know, just memorize it. <laughs> so. All right, so that is the briefest of summaries of how to amend any state's constitution with a few specifics about how to amend Florida's constitution. But with that said, let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the issues that arise there. So now you're gonna join me please in the text where we talk about those five methods of proposing amendments. We're in chapter 14, subsection B. If you've got the electronic version, page 502, if you've got the paper version. So assuming Florida's courts allow the vote, all the proposals get voted on by who? The Florida electorate, right? All us registered voters who show up at the ballot box. So the first way is a proposal by Florida's legislature. And I should keep these on the big board so you can see them there. So now we're in subsection B1, still on page 502. So we're talking about Article 9 of Florida's Constitution, we're talking about Section 1, amendment of a section or revision of one or more articles or the whole of this Constitution may be proposed by joint resolution agreed to by three-fifths of the membership of each house of the legislature of the state of Florida. The full text of the joint resolution and the vote of each member voting shall be entered on the journal of each house. So you're outraged that your particular elected official was not in favor? You've got a record. You can see whether your elected official was in favor. Let's throw in a few details about a second method of proposing amendments. That was the Constitutional Revision Commission. Remember, there were two separate commissions that are created by the plain text of the Constitution of the state of Florida. The first one I want to look at is the Constitutional Revision Commission, which has most recently been abbreviated as the CRC, because nowadays everything needs an abbreviation. Yeah. Okay. So here we're talking about Article 9, Section 2. Once every 20 years, oh, that was dramatic. <laughs> Once every 20 years, this commission is going to meet. So it met approximately two years ago. So approximately 18 years from now, they'll meet again. It's going to have 37 members on this commission. Who's going to be those members? Well, if we look at Florida's Constitution in Article 11, subsection 2, subsection A, we see a numbered list. First, the Attorney General, she's going to be there. She is, by constitutional fiat in the plain language of the Constitution, a member of the commission, whether she likes that or not. Next, number two on the list, 15 members selected by the governor. So the governor is going to have at least 15 of the 37 votes assuming the governor chooses wisely and chooses like-minded individuals who share the governor's goal of whatever the governor wants to achieve by way of the Constitutional Revision Commission. Number three says nine members selected by the Speaker of the House of Representatives and nine members selected by the President of the Senate. And we're talking about the state of Florida House of Representatives and we're talking about the Florida Senate. So, the governor, on behalf of the executive branch, had the power of appointing 15 out of 37 members. But together, the legislative branch of the state of Florida had the power to appoint 
18 members. How's my math? Nine plus nine? Did I get it right? Yeah. 18 members from the legislative branch. Looking at number four, we see that the judicial branch also gets a say. Yeah, the chief judge of the Supreme Court of Florida, with the advice of the other justices of the Supreme Court of Florida, will appoint three members. Oh. Hmm. Okay. The governor will designate one member of the commission as the commission's chair. Vacancies in the membership, if it happens while the commission has been convened and before it wraps up and finishes its work, is filled in the same manner as it was originally appointed. Each constitutional revision commission is going to meet once every 20 years. They convene at the call of its chair, and one of the first orders of business is to determine the orders of business. Yes, the Constitutional Commission, when it meets, will adopt its own rules of procedure. Were there rules of procedure adopted 20 years ago for the prior commission? Sure there were, but they're not binding on today's commission. Today's commission, in its First order of business will determine its own order of business, and that can be critical because, as you remember, it's the vote of this commission that determines whether or not something becomes a proposal. So how and when and whether and how many votes can be critical, and that's the first or among the first order of business. Next order of business is to examine the Constitution of the state. So if they haven't read it already, now's the time. Hold public hearings. So even though this isn't a means of voter initiative, still, we voters should be given the opportunity to be heard. And not later than 180 days prior to the next election, file with the custodian of records. That's the Florida custodian of state records. Any proposals that resulted from its own internal procedures. So that's how that particular commission works. Before I get to another commission, that's the other commission's in here too, right? Yeah, that's number five. Let me turn instead to number three. We're now on page 504. And we'll take a closer look at some of the details about voter initiatives or initiatives by the people. It was a 1968 enactment of Florida's constitution that provided citizens with the right to propose amendments to Florida's constitution by initiative. So when we had that constitutional convention and tore up the old Florida constitution in 1968, the new constitution included this voter initiative means. According to this article from Nova Law Review that I'm quoting again, I must have really liked this one when I was writing the book, quote, residents of Florida have a specific right that citizens of many other states do not have. Okay. They have the power to amend their state constitution by gathering a set number of signatures on petitions calling for an amendment to be placed on a statewide ballot for ratification, end quote. And then I go on to state that Floridians are the direct origin of these proposals. No involvement is necessary from Florida's executive, legislative, or judicial branches. No involvement by any state agency or administrative law agency is needed in order to start the process. And no involvement by any county, city, town, village, or lawmaking body needs to pass in order for this to happen. This truly is by the people and for the people. This truly is a voter initiative. This truly is direct democracy. And that's what makes it different from a referendum. A referendum is first proposed by a lawmaking body, and then it's decided by voters. So this is different than a referendum. Initiatives originate with the people, and they don't require any type of legislative approval, whether that's the U.S. Congress or whether that's the Florida legislature or whether that's the Board of County Commissioners, or whether that's City Hall, no collegiate body needs to approve this. We the people can do this ourselves. 
So that's what separates a voter initiative from a referendum. For the plain text, we want to turn, of course, to Article 11 of Florida's Constitution, and now we're in Section 3. There, you see the following relevant language. The power to propose the revision or amendment or any portion or portions of this Constitution by initiative is reserved to the people, provided that any such revision or amendment, except for those limiting the power of government to raise revenue, shall embrace but one subject and one subject matter directly connected therewith. That's that single subject rule that we talked about earlier. Continue with the quote now, quote, it may be invoked by filing with the custodian of state records a petition containing a copy of the proposed revision or amendment signed by a number of electors in each of one half of the congressional districts of the state and of the state as a whole equal to 8% of the votes cast in each of such districts respectively and in the state as a whole in the last preceding election in which presidential electors were chosen. That's a mouthful and that's why on the big board I just put 8%. What did I mean by 8%? Well, we're gonna look back at the number of people who voted in a past Florida election but not just any past Florida election, the last time that we were voting for a president. And since you've already studied the federal constitution, you know that even though you cast your vote by name, you know, maybe it says President Brandon and you vote, let's go Brandon. You're not actually voting directly for this hypothetical President Brandon, you're voting to have your electors, somebody got the joke, thank you. So, <laughs> have your electors go forth and vote for that candidate. Likewise, whichever election it was where presidential electors were getting chosen, is it fair game when I write the, the final exam and I put hypotheticals in there to have a hypothetical president, Brandon? Is that fair game? I, don't know. I digress. Anyway, so. We're looking to look back at that last election where Floridians voted for president or to state it in a more technically correct way, voted for presidential electors. That's going to give us our count, our number for which we're going to do some of this math about the 8%. Remember the math, you're going to need 8% of the number of electors of each of one half of the congressional districts of the state and of the state as a whole. So if you're a fine mathematician, I struggled earlier with the nine plus nine, maybe you're better than I am, you can figure that out. And if you're getting signatures, if you're pounding the pavement, if you're getting people to sign off on a voter initiative to amend Florida's constitution, you better know that number, right? Because you gotta beat that number. That's how many signatures you need in order for your voter initiative proposal to be valid enough that it makes it to the statewide ballot. So my recommendation, if you're working for your own personal goals or your client's goals, turn to Article 11, turn to subsection three, then get the relevant data and crunch the numbers and err on the side of too many signatures, right? For me, that would be a tip along the lines of best practices. So now if you need a step-by-step -step guide, I found one and I reprinted it in part. It's got numbers one, two, three, four, and five here. And I'm quoting from something written by a former Florida Attorney General, Secretary of State, and published in the Nova Law Review. I'm quoting from pages 5, 12 through 13. Number one said to contact the Department of State's Division of Elections and request a free packet of information. Yeah, it's free. Might as well do that, right? Number two, sponsors must register as a political committee with the Division of Elections before circulating the petition. When it comes to these prerequisites, you gotta do them first. So it helps to know the prerequisites. And there's one in number two. Number three, sponsors must submit the text of the proposed amendment to the Secretary of State for review. Is that a prior restraint of 
from upon free speech? Well, I'll let you decide. One way to deal with it is to just do it. The secretary approves the form of the petition, but not its legal sufficiency. The form will be checked for completeness, for the correct number of words in the ballot title. Wow. Got to have 15 words or less in the ballot title. How about that? And correct number of words in the summary. Wow. The ballot summary has to contain 75 words or less. How about that? And the correct size and format of the petition. So whether or not it's a prior restraint upon free speech, I'll leave that up to others to decide. I'll just point out that it's nice to have a helping hand when you've got such strict requirements. Maybe. Once approved, the petition can be circulated to obtain the requisite number of signatures. Number four on the list, when at least 10% of the required number of signatures from one quarter of the congressional districts is collected, the Secretary of State shall submit the petition language to the Attorney General, who will then forward the petition to the Supreme Court of Florida. Now you remember, nobody has standing under Florida's constitution to get an advisory opinion from any court with just one exception. Florida's attorney general has constitutional standing under the constitution of the state of Florida to obtain an advisory opinion on certain subjects from one particular court, the Supreme Court of Florida. This is one of those subjects. So the advisory opinion that will be sought is about whether the text conforms to the requirements of Article 11, Section 3. And under an enabling statute in the Florida statutes, currently numbered 101.161 Florida statutes, Supreme Court of Florida in its advisory opinion will also determine if the ballot title and the summary of the amendment comply with the requirements of Article 11, Section 3. Was that a good statute to put on the books or a bad one? Again, I'll leave it up to you as to what part of the law is good or what part of the law is bad. I'll just simply point out that when it comes to these amendments getting shot down by the Supreme Court of Florida, statistically more are shot down because of ballot title and ballot summary violations than any other reason. So was Florida Statute 101.161 a good idea or a bad idea? Again, I'll leave that up to you. I'll just give you the statistics. What's number five on my list, reprinted from the Nova Law Review in my textbook. Number five, sponsors must deliver the petitions to the supervisor of elections in order for the signatures to be verified. So as enthusiastic as you might be, don't get writer's cramp forging a lot of names because somebody's going to check those signatures on that ballot voter initiative. Supervisor of Elections is going to check it, and the Law Review article warns, quote, process can take several weeks or longer if the supervisor's staff is extremely busy, end quote. So if the supervisor's staff is on your side, they're probably going to burn the midnight oil. If they're not, maybe they're really, really busy. I don't know. So watch out for that. We've got some notes and questions to consider under this. Subsection three about voter initiatives. Question one asks, what are the advantages and disadvantages to amending state constitutions by citizen initiatives? And yours truly in writing this book, quoted from yours truly in the other book he writes. If I don't quote my own book, why should I expect anyone else to, right? So I quoted me as saying, quote, from one point of view, this is the purest form of direct democracy in state lawmaking. From another point of view, this is the reason why state constitutions are so long and mundane. For example, thanks to a voter initiative, the Constitution of the state of Florida grants constitutional rights to pregnant pigs in Article 10, Section 21, end quote. I'm quoting from Patrick John McGinley, Florida Municipal Law and Practice. And I thank the good folks at Thompson Reuters Westlaw who peer reviewed that book and didn't strike that language. So I think it's kind of cool to point out. 
In the plain text of Florida's constitution, is there any reference to pregnant women? No, but there is a reference to pregnant pigs. <laughs> Again, good, bad, that's up to you. I'll just point these things out. No the question to consider number two. Florida municipal law and practice summarizes the voter initiative as follows. Oh, okay, quoting for myself again. You knew my ego was big. Did you know it was this big? <laughs> Quote, voter initiatives occur in Florida when the custodian of state records receives a petition containing a copy of the proposed revision or amendment signed by a number of electors in each of one half of the congressional districts of the state and of the state as a whole equal to 8% of the votes cast in each of such districts respectively and in the state as a whole in the last preceding election in which presidential electors were chosen. These specific numbers and percentages are mandated by Article 10, I'm sorry, Article 11, Section 3 of the Florida Constitution, end quote. Then the question is, are these requirements unduly burdensome? Anybody got an opinion on that? Opinions are like noses. Everybody has one. Never seen a nose that was wrong, right? Just different nose. So what's your nose say? It's good. It's bad. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I like that opinion. I can't blame you one bit with that concern. Can't blame you one bit at all. Anybody want to agree or disagree? I agree. Okay, something to think about. Yeah, yeah. You you think it should be more burdens? Tell us why. Uh, Have something to do with pregnant pigs? <laughs> Yeah. Any kind of watered down power that the Constitution has. Well, it should be easier to get laws passed yeah. at the legislative level. Yeah. But I think constitutional amendments should be kind of reserved for like the major issues, mm -hmm. not going back and forth politically on whether or not the bills are bullet train. Yeah. Whether or not the kind of bullet train must be, bullet train can't be, bullet train could be. Yeah. Back and forth, back and forth. Well, it's well said, well reasoned. Yeah, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. You're saying, you know, we amended the Constitution, and then if we want to change the amendment, it's more burdensome than just getting our elected officials to draft a bill and enact the bill. Hmm, yeah. Okay, I see I see your point of view there. As I mentioned, well stated, well reasoned. All right. So number four, or a fourth way, it's number five on our big board, it's number four in the book, on page 507 if you're paper, is that constitutional convention. So one way of amending, and I'll put amending in air quotes there, because we're doing a lot more than just changing a few words, a few lines, a few paragraphs, or even a few pages, right? We're figuratively and almost literally tearing up the old document, replacing it whole cloth with a new document. That's the purpose of the Constitutional Convention, if one is called. And like most states, Florida refers to this as the calling of the Constitutional Convention. To summarize the procedure, I quoted from I, where I said, quote, Article 11, Section 3 of the Florida Constitution requires the following action and deadlines. Constitutional Convention convenes if Florida's voters file with the custodian of the state records a petition containing a declaration that a constitutional convention is desired, signed by a number of electors in each of one half of the congressional districts of the state and of the state as a whole, equal to 15% of the votes cast in each such district respectfully and in the state as a whole in the last preceding election of presidential electors. Let me pause the quote there for just a moment. I'll resume the quote in a minute, but I pause the quote to point out some rather similar sounding language, but where the numbers were different, right? Yet again, just as when we needed to turn 
to the number of votes necessary for a voter initiative, when it comes to the number of votes necessary for a constitutional convention, we again looked at the number of people who voted in a particular Florida election in the past, that particular election being a presidential election. We go to the ballot box more than once every four years, but we only go there once every four years for U.S. president. So we're looking back at the most recent of U.S. president votes, or to state that with more technical precision, the last election of presidential electors. But again, we're going to look at the congressional districts of the state, and we're going to look at the state as a whole, but check out that the percentage changed. What I mean by that is for a voter initiative, the percentage of the congressional districts and state as a whole was 8%. Here, the percentage is 15%. Did you catch that? When I was reading that a mile a minute with the remnants of my New York accent, I miss New York. Haven't been there in years. Go New York Giants. It's tough rooting for the Giants. <laughs> Anybody else root for the Giants? Makes every Sunday just a little bit more painful if you're a Giants fan. <laughs> what have we got? Four wins so far? The season's quickly coming to a close. <laughs> so we beat the Saints. That was fun. Watch that game with Bernadette, my wife, over at Tibby's. If you're familiar with that local chain, Tibby's, they have a New Orleans theme. So room full of Saints fans there. And me and Bernadette. We were cheering at all the wrong times in their opinion. We were cheering at the right times in our opinion. So we root for the Giants. But I digress. Let me get back to this quote. So here's me again quoting me, quote, At the next general election held more than 90 days after the filing of such petition, there shall be submitted to the electors of the state the following question. This is verbatim the question. Shall a constitutional convention be held? You vote yes or no. If the majority vote in the affirmative, at the next succeeding general election, there'll be sh there shall be elected from each representative district a member of a constitutional convention. All right, so we've got at least two ballots before this happens, right? Then on the 21st day following that election, the convention shall sit at the Capitol, elect officers, adopt rules of procedure, judge the election of its membership, and fix a time and place for its future meetings. Not later than 90 days before the next succeeding general election, the convention shall cause to be filed with custodian state records any revision of this constitution proposed by it. So that was me quoting from Florida Municipal Law and Practice, available wherever fine law books are sold. So the full text can be found. <laughs> I, I got a family to support. I got to sell some law books here. <laughs> and by the way, if any of you bought my law book, thank you. I thank you. My wife thanks you. My son and daughter who I have shoes, thank you. My, my mortgage company who got its mortgage payment, thanks you. Electric company, thanks you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Subsection five returns to the commission method. We already talked about one of those commissions, that being the Constitutional Revision Commission. Now we turn to the other type of commission created under the Florida's Constitution, the Taxation and Budget Reform Commission. Article 7 creates this commission to meet once every 20 years. But it's a different 20th year than the other commission, for those of you who are you know, planning ahead for your resume, you know, hoping to get on the Taxation and Budget Reform Commission. Man, okay. So how does this one work? Well, look at Article 7, subsection 6. Beginning in the year 2007 and each 20th year thereafter. So we got one coming up in about six years, right? Get that resume ready. There shall be established a Taxation and Budget Reform Commission composed of the following members. This is Article 7, subsection 6, subsection A that gives us a numbered list. Number one. We're going to have 11 members selected by the governor, none of whom shall be a member of the legislature at the time of appointment. Number two, we're going to have seven members selected by the Speaker of the House of Representatives of the state of Florida 
and another seven members selected by the president of the Senate of Florida Senate, none of whom shall be members of the legislature at the time of appointment. So if you keep a track, Florida's executive branch put 11 on this commission. Florida's legislative branch is putting a total of 14 on this commission. Number three says there'll be four non-voting ex officio members, all of whom shall be members of the legislature at the time of appointment. They must be really important people, huh? Yeah, they could have been at the legislature doing the people's work. Instead, we're going to have them sit here and, and not vote as part of the Taxation Budget Reform Commission. But I guess even though they don't have a vote, they still have a seat at the table, right? They still have the ears, I would hope, of the other members of the Taxation and Budget and Reform Commission that do have a vote, right? Now, at the initial meeting, the members of the commission are going to elect a member who's not a member of the legislature. So those four non-voting guys, they're not getting elected. And that person is going to serve as the chair. And that person is going to adopt the rules of procedure. So that gives that person a little bit of procedural power there, does it not? Thereafter, the commission shall convene when? At the call of the chair. Woo, this chair is getting some power here, right? An affirmative vote of two-thirds of the full commission shall be necessary for any revision of the Constitution or any part of it to be proposed by the commission. So the procedure for this commission is less flexible than the other, by which I mean when you compare how the Constitution Revision Commission works versus how the Taxation and Budget Reform Commission works, you see that there's more specifics that can't be violated and have to be followed when it comes to the Taxation and Budget Reform Commission versus the Constitutional Revision Commission. Wouldn't you agree? And would you stay awake? How about a break? Who needs a break? Give me a break. Give me a break. Yeah, all right. But before we take that break, let's buzz through like a madman trying to check off a box, saying he covered the case, but not covering great detail. Let's cover Detzer versus Anstead. What's going on over here? Who's Detzner? Well, at the time of this case, that comes from the Supreme Court of the State of Florida in the year 2018. Ken Detzner was the Secretary of State of Florida, Florida Secretary of State. The Circuit Court of the Second Judicial Circuit said that the ballot titles and summaries of three proposed amendments are hereby stricken from the November 2018 general election ballot. An appeal was taken. What did Florida's First District Court of Appeal say? They invoked pass-through jurisdiction to the Supreme Court of Florida, by which I mean, and you remember from our prior lecture, one of the ways a case can get to the Supreme Court of Florida is if a district court of appeal certifies the question as one of great public importance. And that is what the first district of the state of Florida did here. So that's how this case got before Florida Supreme Court which then held, quote, the circuit court was incorrect in finding any deficiency in the proposals or ballot summaries on the merits. Why is that? Well, the circuit court found them defective because each of those amendments bundled together separate and unrelated proposals. Ooh, sounds like that single subject rule, right? The court, the circuit court, held that such bundling violated Florida Statutes 101.161, which we talked about earlier, as an enabling statute. But the Supreme Court of Florida disagrees. When it comes to the Constitutional Revision Commission, there is no restriction against bundling, if you want to call it that, or violation of the single subject rule, if you want to call it that, these requirements weren't part of the plain text of the Constitution of the State of Florida. One of our canons of construction or rules of construction for interpreting or analyzing the Constitution of the State of Florida is as follows. When the Constitution of the State of Florida says in detail how to do a thing, 
Doing that thing in any other way is unconstitutional. Applying that maxim or that rule of thumb or that canon of construction, Florida Supreme Court said there was no rule against the Constitutional Revision Commission bundling things. There was no rule saying the Constitutional Revision Commission had to follow the single subject rule, and therefore we will not impose such a requirement. Any questions about that holding from Detzner versus Anstead? Yeah, you want that break, I promise, right? Break starts now. I'll see you in 10 minutes. Sound good? See you in 10. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you want to? I will correct your style. I, in the instructions I gave you, my rubric and how I'm going to grade. Okay. So that's how I'm going to grade it. I, I didn't give points for science. I didn't take away points for science. Okay. So whatever helps you get the high score in that rubric. You know, whatever your style is, I respect. It's not grading based on punctuation. Not grading based on spelling. Not grading based on grammar. As you can tell from the rubric, I'm grading. I'm grading based on content. I'm grading on analysis. I expect, like I said in the rubric, to see an opinion. Yeah. And I expect to see that opinion supported by argument. Okay. Which is what the lawyers do, whether they're negotiating in, the, in a boardroom or going into a courtroom or trying to sign up a new client, right? <laughs> so it's an important skill, and that's the skill of grading. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
Melissa, Maria, Jeremy, Sarah, y'all back yet? All four y'all? Thank you, thank you. I got your email. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. One more, one more. No. I don't want to cut your applause short. One of you's missing. I don't know what you back yet, but I, I read it. Ready. Perfect. Well done. Agreed, everybody. On the website, you can click the link for the outline. It was there. It's work. Yeah. Okay, I think I think that was 10 minutes. Did I do the math right? A lot of math to be done in this lecture today. Well, hopefully that was a full 10 minutes. I want to don't want to cut your break short. But as I was mentioned during the break, uh, Jonathan is brave. Here I am. It is I, says Jonathan. He's our 
Lead Council Speaker, thank you, sir. Appreciate that. And also your, uh, a world of thanks to Melissa, to Maria, to Jeremy, to Sarah. Uh, if you haven't been to flaconstitution.com yet and saw the, their handiwork, their beautiful outline, I, I certainly recommend you going there. It was well written and well done, and we all benefit from it. So I think, I think a round of applause is due to all five legal counsel. Lead counsel, thank you, lead counsel. Due process of law is a constitutional right, not only under the federal constitution, but also under the constitution of the state of Florida. And that's what I want to draw your attention to today when we talk about our lecture on due process and on a particular implication or application of due process when we talk about access to courts. But before we get to access to courts, we need to look and understand at what is meant by due process of law. What is due process of law? Like the federal constitution, our state constitution in its text grants us due process of law. And thankfully, due to a 2018 amendment, grants due process of law to every Floridian regardless of that Floridian's race. It is sad but true that until the year 2018, there was a limitation in Florida's constitution as to who received due process of law under Florida's constitution, at least in the language of Florida's constitution. One of the alien land laws, they are called, was added to Florida's constitution. Long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, there was a presidential candidate. Not in my lifetime, not in your parents' lifetime, probably not even in your grandparents' lifetime. And this particular candidate, whose name really isn't worth remembering, was running on a platform of anti-Catholicism. The anti-Catholic vote is what this person wanted. Around that same time that amendments were added to Florida's constitution, scaling back the constitutional right of freedom of religion and the use of funds for sectarian means was the language chosen and put in our constitution of the state of Florida which was intended to refer to my faith, Catholicism, around that same era, the alien land laws were popular. These laws said that our brothers and sisters who are Asian Americans did not have the right to buy, sell, own, or inherit real property. Is that discrimination? Yes. Is that racism? Yes. Is that deplorable? Yes. Is that disgusting? Yes. Is that unfortunate? Yes. Is that horrible to even have to talk about? Yes. But it was part of our history. And until the year 2018 was part of our due process clause in Article 1 of the Constitution of the State of Florida. It was a Constitution Revision Commission's proposal bundled with unrelated things that made its way to the ballot and passed and removed that racist, bigoted, disgusting language from our state constitution. Of course, before that time, that language in our state constitution was unconstitutional. Because as we've studied again and again as our semester has progressed, even the language of a state's constitution can be held unconstitutional under the federal constitution. And there should have been no doubt, certainly it was unconstitutional under the federal constitution for the alien land law to appear in our state constitution. That disgusting, bigoted language clearly was unconstitutional under the federal constitution, but yet it persisted. And it pers persisted despite a prior proposal making it to the ballot before 2018, 
which would have stricken that language, but Florida voters did not pass that amendment. So as we saw when we studied how to amend the Constitution, and as we saw in cases such as Densler versus Anslow, gosh, I just covered the case. Densler versus Anstead that we just covered a few minutes ago. Maybe you've forgotten the name already. I know that. But it held that the single subject rule doesn't apply to a proposal from the Constitutional Revision Commission. And that particular proposal in 2018 bundled the striking of this disgusting language with other things. And since the bundled proposal passed, finally that language was removed. And now we have a due process requirement in the text of the Constitution of the State of Florida, which is for all intents and purposes indistinguishable from the constitutional right of due process that we see under the federal constitution. And what is that right? You studied it in federal con law. So I apologize for reviewing it with you now because you already know it. You already know that due process of law contains two components. One is a substantive component. The other is a procedural component. What is procedural due process of law? It is a constitutional right to notice and opportunity, by which I mean you have a constitutional right to fair notice of a certain thing, such as a government action, or a court proceeding or hearing, and you have a right to an opportunity to be heard. Those are the two components of the procedural right to due process. But it has also been found under the federal constitution and our state constitution is the same, that there is a substantive due process right that substantive right it goes beyond procedure as explained as i wrote in the text quote procedural due process serves as a vehicle to ensure fair treatment through the proper administration of justice where substantive rights are at issue procedural due process guarantees to every citizen the right to have that course of legal procedure which has been established in our judicial system for the protection and enforcement of private rights. It contemplates that the defendant shall be given a fair notice and afforded a real opportunity to be heard before judgment is rendered against him or her. While the doctrines of substantive or procedural due process play distinct roles, they frequently overlap. Hence, many cases do not expressly state the distinction between procedural and substantive due process. But they are very different, are they not? We can all think of certain beautiful and cherished constitutional rights that our fellow Americans enjoy today because they were found to exist within substantive due process. So going beyond just the procedure, substantive due process has been a means by which the judiciary has found and enforced the human rights of our fellow Americans. What then do we do in a state con law class with these notions. After all, what we've got is a mirror image under state constitutional law of these particular rights. And it doesn't have to be that way. And indeed, if I search and I look, I can make the argument that at least in one way, Florida constitutional law has expanded upon the right of due process of law. I state this to you 
as a hypothesis. And I allow you to decide for yourself whether my hypothesis is correct. My hypothesis is this. Unlike Americans as a whole, Floridians have a greater procedural right to due process of law in civil cases. Because in civil cases under Florida's constitution, unlike civil cases where Florida's constitution does not apply, the Floridian has a constitutional right to be free from a conclusive presumption, also known in the case law as an irrebuttable presumption. That's my hypothesis. Now we know that Florida has a declaration of rights. It is article one of the constitution, unlike the federal constitution where it's the first 10 amendments that essentially declare most of our rights. We in the 1968 version of Florida's constitution put front and center, article one, page one, begins the recitation of a Floridian's declaration of rights in the Florida constitution. Prior to 1868, 14th Amendment to the federal constitution, it was state constitutions that were the primary source of human rights vis-a-vis -vis the actions of a state government. And although that's no longer true, still a state constitution can provide greater rights to a state citizen. As you know from our studies of the concept of a laboratory of democracy, no state may deny any state resident anything less than the full panoply of federal human rights, whether that federal human right is enshrined in the plain text of the federal constitution, or whether instead in the text of the United States Code, or whether instead arising from case law precedent, such as from the Supreme Court of the United States, or whether instead found in the federal administrative code or other sources of federal law, regardless of where that human right is enshrined in federal law, the full panoply of federal rights must be granted to every state citizen. No state law can grant anything less than that full panoply of federal rights, not even a state's constitution can deny the full panoply of federal rights. The federal constitution supremacy clause says that federal rights are supreme over all state law, including the state constitution. With that said, that's just the floor. That's just the bare minimum. The full panoply of federal rights is the bare minimum a state must grant. Under that concept, we've labeled a laboratory of democracy. States can experiment with granting greater rights to its citizens, so long as by doing so, the state does not grant anything less than the full panoply of federal rights. And that's why I highlight on the slide the third note there. A state's constitution can create new rights absent from the federal constitution so long as those requirements I just covered are met. Can the state create a new right that violates the federal constitution? No. But if all federal rights are respected and granted and none are violated, then under that condition, the laboratory of democracy concept means that states can grant more rights. My hypothesis is that that has what ha happened when it comes to procedural due process under Florida's constitution as applied to civil law cases. Substantive due process and procedural due process as provided by the constitution of the state of Florida are the same rights as provided by the constitution of the United States. But with that truth having been acknowledged, perhaps the argument could be made that the right of due process of law under the Florida Constitution slightly exceeds that granted 
by the Constitution of the United States, at least insofar as Florida constitutional jurisprudence makes much ado about rejecting as unconstitutional any civil law of the Florida legislature that establishes a factual presumption that may not be rebutted by contrary factual evidence. What I'm saying is that under state civil law, unlike federal civil law, a Floridian has protection against an irrebuttable or a conclusive presumption. Case law spells out what the test is under Florida's constitution as to whether a particular presumption in a state statute is conclusive or irrebuttable and therefore unconstitutional under the constitution of the state of Florida. And the test is twofold. To be constitutional, first, there's got to be a rational connection between the fact proved and the ultimate fact presumed. Second, there's got to be a right to rebut that conclusion in a fair manner. So that's a two-pronged test, at least technically. But did you hear the words we used in the first prong? It's got to be a rational connection, says the case law, which the case law then fleshes out under Florida's constitution to be nearly indistinguishable from the federal rational relationship test. You remember that test? That was the lowest level of scrutiny under the federal constitution. That's the one where the government almost always wins, right? Under the federal constitution and here under the state constitution, under the test for whether the presumption is unconstitutional under Florida's constitution for being conclusive or irrebuttable. The first prong of the two prongs adopts that very easy to meet standard where the government almost always wins. So the first prong, there's got to be a rational connection between the fact presumed and the ultimate, I'm sorry, the fact that you proved and the ultimate fact that was presumed. That was just the first prong. The second prong has a little bit more bite. Again, not talking about a big wallop with a sledgehammer over the head kind of bite. Not talking about a shark bite. Talking more about like, uh, I don't know, what Bichon Frise bite. Anybody been bitten by Bichon Frise? Mine's healing. My bite from Bichon, Bichon Frise. I live. You can survive that Bichon Frise attack. Anybody know what a Bichon Frise looks like? Google an image. Imagine that attacking you. Right? Pretty much laughing at the time, right? Yeah, anyway. Okay, so with that bite of a Bichon Frise, we have the second prong. There's got to be a right to rebut in a fair manner. McGinley, you type this deep to find a difference between procedural due process and the federal and the state? Yes, I did. I love you that much, man. That's how deep I'm going to die. And my question then, has Florida expanded a federal constitutional right? I'm going to argue yes. How am I going to make that argument? There is a federal constitutional right for a criminal defendant to be free from any sort of conclusive or irrebuttable presumption. Under the federal constitution and the case law precedent interpreting it, if you're charged with a crime, whether that's a federal crime or a state crime. If you're charged with something where you could lose your freedom instead of just your money, the federal constitutional law says there can't be a conclusive or an irrebuttable presumption. But federal constitutional law does not apply that to civil cases. Federal constitutional law says nothing about extending that presumption to cases where all you can lose is your money or your workers' compensation benefits, as Jonathan is going to give us great detail about soon. Thanks, man, for being our lead counsel covering that. So federal constitutional law didn't go that far. 
But state constitutional law did. So that's why I argue that there is this little, little, little bit of difference between state procedural due process under Florida's constitution and federal procedural due process. What do you think? Do you agree with me? I put it forth as a hypothesis. Do you agree with me? If a Floridian has a right in a civil case that Americans don't have as a whole, that'd be a difference, right? I think so. I think so. To best understand this difference, we don't want to mince words. We want to understand what exactly is meant in a civil case by a presumption. A presumption and an inference are two different things. Do you understand the difference? Would a hypothetical help? Here's a hypothetical. In this case, the witnesses were on the street hearing the two individuals fighting, screaming, yelling, swinging fists. Then one of the two individuals, just one, took out a gun. The other individual retreated into the house. The individual holding the gun followed. None of the witnesses could see either individual anymore, but they heard loud and clear what all believed to have been the sound of a gunshot. After the sound of the gunshot, out came the individual who was originally holding the gun, still holding the gun, but now the witnesses see what they believe to be smoke coming out of the gun. Literally holding a smoking gun. That individual ran off, but the other individual was nowhere to be seen. So the witnesses went into the house and there was the empty house, empty of all but the body of the first person who was in, fight, was in part of the fight, now laying on the floor dead from a gunshot wound. Nowhere else in the house could a gun be found. Did the person with the smoking gun shoot that other person. Well, we don't have an eyewitness who saw it, do we? None of the witnesses saw it. But is anybody going to conclude otherwise? No. That's an inference. That evidence, if put forth in a case, is inferential. We infer that the assailant running away with the smoking gun was the one who shot the other combatant in that fight. But that's not a presumption. That's a factual inference created by the facts of the case. What then is a presumption? A presumption would be, and again, this is hypothetical, Florida statute hypothetical 543.210, says whenever witnesses see someone running with a smoking gun, we presume that that person fired the gun. That's a presumption because it arises not from the facts and the evidence put forth in the case. It arises from the statute. The difference between an inference and a presumption is its origin, is its source. It's the proof, the witness testimony, the photographs, the videos, the expert conclusions, the documents and evidence that can create an inference. It's the statute or the ordinance or the administrative code that creates the presumption. The difference is the origin. You see that? Okay, so is a Floridian entitled to an order ad limine, keeping out of evidence the nine witnesses who saw the smoking gun and then walked inside the house and saw the body? No, but the Floridian might be entitled to protection from the statute if it existed, saying that someone who's running with a smoking gun is presumed to have fired that gun. See the difference? understand then what I'm talking about. And again, I'm talking about very narrow circumstances. 
but they arise. And when they do, Floridians have a different and greater right than Americans have as a whole is my hypothesis. As we continue to learn about this, continue to ask yourself, is McGinley's hypothesis correct? Ask yourself. First way we'll look at that and we'll ask about it is a decision from the District Court of Appeal in Hall versus Ricci America. Jonathan, you are our lead counsel who decided to speak in class. <laughs> no good deed goes unpunished, sir. So please tell us what's going on in Hall versus Reach America from the first district court of appeal. Is it not the state of Florida? Yeah. What's Florida's first DCA up against here? What's the facts of the case? What's going on? What the dealy, yo? So, so uh, Hall, or Reach America, uh, is a construction worker. Yeah. Uh, he got injured uh, on the job. Uh, another construction worker hurt on the job. Sounds like Florida's workers' compensation law might apply. It is. Uh, yeah. He was denied, but he's a worker working on the job, Jonathan. How could he be denied? Well, he, uh, he had a little fun five days before uh, bringing in. Okay. Marijuana. Oh. Yeah, he, uh, he, after he got injured, he got tested. Um, so he's injured. They've got a drug free workplace. And as part of that, not only do we send you to a doctor when you get injured at our workplace, but we tell that doc to take a drug test or administer a drug test to the injured worker. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. Mr. Ricci, when he was relaxing on his off hours, it wasn't the Miller High Life, was it? <laughs> no. well, it was the, uh, it was Puff the Magic Dragon. Right. <laughs> it was the doobie. Um, so when, when he tested, he, he failed. Um, or so he got tested and he was by 2% of the grams. So it's so he, um, Mr. Ricci, tested positive for marijuana. Right. Yeah. And, and the, it was even uh, reviewed, I guess, by the Florida Department of Health. Uh, doctor said that um, it was likely that what he was saying was true. Uh, was mm. Okay. That he, he had it smoked at least five years before. Okay. That Wow. So, well, let me, you've got more to say, but I like what you've said so far. So allow me to interrupt and just kind of summarize there because yeah. I don't want anybody to miss these important points. So he's injured on the job. He's covered, therefore, in this construction work by Florida's workers' compensation law. The employer and the insurance company didn't provide the benefits. So he's got a right. Can't sue your employer, but you can file a petition for benefits in front of the State of Florida Division of Administrative Hearings Offices of the Judges of Compensation Claims. That's a mouthful. We'll call them JCC for short. So you file your petition for benefits in front of the JCC, and that's kind of like a bench trial. It's not a Article 5 or, sorry, Florida's Constitution Article 3 judge, but, but it is an administrative law judge. So you're allowed to offer evidence, of course, procedural due process law, notice an opportunity to be heard. Part of the evidence, as Jonathan just summarized and summarized it well, was expert testimony that was unrebutted that said that even though injured worker Mr. Ricci tested positive for marijuana to a small degree, there was no effect. It was the remnant of having the marijuana in the past. He was not high. He was not intoxicated. He was not affected. He was not injured because of the marijuana. Indeed, Jonathan, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's in the job site and somebody else swings a beam and bashes him in the head. Uh, so whether he's yeah. stoned or not, which I guess he was not, whether he's stoned or not, he was still getting beamed in the head. Quite literally at this point, right? <laughs> yeah. So Jonathan, he offered this proof. Right. The proof is from an expert admitted into evidence. The expert's testimony is supported by the drug test and the expert's expertise. There is no opposing drug test. There is no opposing expert. The evidence is unrebutted. So naturally, he overcame the presumption and won, right, Jonathan? Uh, unfortunately, he, he was otherwise eligible for compensation. However, there's a lot He lost. It explicit, explicit, irrebuttable presumption. Right. In the statute, 
at the time, Florida Statute Chapter 440, Florida Workers' Compensation Act, said that if you were an employee of a drug-free workplace and a properly administered drug test pursuant to that drug-free work test was, place was given, and you couldn't prove a flaw in the administration of that drug test, then it was presumed that the drugs, not the workplace, caused your accident. Under that presumption, Jonathan, what did the judge of compensation claims rule on that petition for workers' compensation benefits? Denied. But as I cut you off, you were telling me the JCC felt compelled to note something. What was that? You were telling me how he felt compelled to deny it, even though the evidence was clear that the workplace caused the injury, not the drugs. Right. You were saying that when I cut you off. <laughs> no, you were. You um, were. And you're right about that. The judge put that in the order. So what's the judge's order saying on review to the First District Court of Appeal? The JCC judge's order is saying... My hands were tied by a conclusive or an irrebuttable presumption. The facts were that it wasn't the drugs that caused the accident. It was the workplace. But Florida Statute Chapter 440 contained a conclusive, irrebuttable presumption that because the drug test was properly administered, it was the drug, not the workplace, that caused the accident. So I'm forced to deny the benefits. What does Florida's First District Court of Appeals say? Uh, they... Do they affirm the denial or did they reverse based on an unconstitutional presumption? Yes, you're correct. They reversed. Tell us why. Yeah. Those two prongs that we covered earlier. Yeah. Which prong failed? Wasn't there, wasn't there a, a rational relationship or a rational connection to use technically correct terms under Florida's constitution on this particular due process, right? Between the workplace and the drugs? Well, there was. There was. So prong one passed, which it almost always does because of the low standard of review. But Jonathan, what about prong two? Um, prong two is what? Prong two is the right to rebut. So the right to rebut in a fair manner. This guy had the right to put on evidence. He did. This guy had the right to call an expert witness. He did. This guy had a right to use the drug test that was in evidence. He did. The expert witness used his expertise as applied to the drug test and testified that the drugs didn't cause the accident. Mr. Ricci wasn't high. He wasn't impaired. It wasn't a factor. And the judge of compensation claims threw up his hands almost and said, I, I understand that. But there's an irrebuttable and conclusive presumption. And the District Court of Appeals said, not anymore, there ain't. I paraphrase. But yeah, they found the presumption irrebuttable. They found it unconstitutional. So today, today, after this decision, would an injured worker like Mr. Ricci receive workers' compensation benefits? Yes. Yes, assuming he and his lawyer do the homework, do the work to get the testimony, to get the evidence, and put it into evidence and prove the facts of the case. So, yeah. So, Jonathan, did the court reach the right decision in your opinion? And again, opinions are like noses. Everybody has one. You can't get this question wrong, Jonathan. But what's your opinion, man? Did the court get it right? Or did the court get it wrong? Yeah, they definitely did. You think they got it right? Tell me why. I agree with you. But tell me why. I Also, there was they they brought up in there that there's two goals with it, and one goal was to the arguably workers' compensation uh, statutes. Primary goal is to give them benefits. Yeah. So it's 
Yeah. Kind of it's often been joked. They don't call it employer's compensation. They call it worker's compensation. So yeah, that, right. there are those that believe the worker might have the upper hand right. in that system. And there are obviously another factor of reducing, uh, reducing the liability from the employer, but these are all other goals. And if there's other portions of the uh, statute, other provisions that uh, require that education and um, there, what else there was, but there's other things that help prevent the in the first place. Yeah. And they said that even if they, um, if that basically that that provision was severable because it didn't really affect the other goal. So good point. Good point. So, yeah, they that. And Judge Kahn fleshes that out very well in the opinion. I thought. Yeah. Yeah. The Judge yeah. Kahn opinion is usually a well-written opinion. I, I don't know that there's any exceptions to that one. So yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with the point you're making, and, and they're well said, well said. Yeah. Anyone have the other opinion? Oh, I don't want to play devil's advocate here because I agree with you too, Jonathan, but I'll do my best. What if it's so important to society that every worker be 100% clean and sober on the workplace, especially a construction site where people are spinning beams around that can clock other people in the head. What if that's so important, a government objective, that we shouldn't make any exceptions? Yeah, I don't like that argument either, but there it is. Who wants to shoot that one down? Please, please, yes, shoot it down, please. Well, couldn't, they, couldn't they write the law that way? Couldn't they, what now? Couldn't they write the law that way? They could write the law that way, and, and in a way they did, at least at the time of reaching versus Right, Hall America. I'm sorry, Hall versus Ricci America. I've been calling him Mr. Ricci. He's Mr. Hall. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't we make the assumption that writing law that if your path had any type of substance in your system at the time of the accident, you're not eligible for And don't make it a presumption that it was the drugs that caused the accident. So you're trying to draft around the constitutional protection. <laughs> And by draft around, I mean you're trying to get the legislature to phrase a statute in such a way that there's still a presumption, but it's not an unconstitutional one. Is that where you're going? Because that's that's a that's a tough tough thing to do, but maybe can be done. Let's 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 think about that. Don't use the presumption. Okay. So rather than saying, oh well, because you were on it. You're not eligible. Right. You think that the drug causes you to act this way. Yeah. So, you know, as part of a condition of your employment, you have to be clean. Okay. And therefore, if you find anything, you're not eligible for this insurance. I hear where you're going. Like, I, think I see what you're doing. One of the things you're doing, you're trying to you're trying to avoid a presumption by saying instead of you're out of the work comp system, you're you're in ineligible. Maybe, maybe, just maybe. Okay. Something like that could work, I wonder, because in Chapter 440 in the Florida statutes, there's a seatbelt defense if a worker's in a motor vehicle accident and had a functioning seatbelt in that car available to them that they could have used, but they chose not to, then that worker isn't denied workers' compensation benefits under Florida's workers' compensation law, but receives a percentage reduction in benefits. And at least to date, and that statute's more than 20 years old, that statute has not been found to be unconstitutional under any standard, including an irrebuttable or conclusive presumption. So maybe, just maybe, just maybe you're on the sun there. I respect where you're going, man. I, I respect it. Or I'm using, like, as part of the contract, I explain. If you sign a contract and you said you have to remain clean to work on the site, and okay. it's not after the accident that you were, you had something in your system. Yeah. I hear you. And again, you might be on to something under Florida Statutes Chapter 440. Uh, there's case law such as Martin versus Carpenter from the, I believe, the Supreme Court of the United States. I'm sorry, Supreme Court of the State of Florida, Martin versus Carpenter, uh, says that the Florida workers' compensation law, there is a defense for an invalid contract of employment. There have been employers who have succeeded in saying that based on a misrepresentation in the employment contract, that voids the 
employment and therefore avoids providing the workers' compensation benefits. Those are some really old cases. They've been distinguished and made inapplicable by other newer cases, but haven't been completely overturned. The Florida Supreme Court's decision in Martin v. Carpenter technically still exists. So again, you might be on to something there. You might be on. But you and I are getting far afield here, man. I'm trying to talk about due process. What's that? You may you may be right. You may be right. Yeah. You may be right. You may be right. Oh, and there's another. There's at least one of them. Maybe a couple other. But I think maybe yours yours was first. I'm not sure. Oh, hey, there you go. All right. How am I doing? Hey, thank you very much. Let the judge deeds know, would you? All right. Thank you. Yeah. And Yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah. yeah. And and that that is I think a compelling oh. argument. I think so. Yes. So, um, what I recall has been the <laughs> question was that, um, whether or not you, it, this was so important for society to maintain a drug free zone. That was the question that started this discussion. So, yes. If, you know, as, as we've already established, I mean, you could, you could smoke 30 days prior and has no relation to, to the issue at hand in worker compensation for the um, for the injured. And um, the judge um, basically that the opinion said said you didn't you didn't have that where you get a drug test and if you um, and if there's a causation between uh, having drugs and being injured, then you get denied benefits. It just needs to and they remanded it. It just needs. They just need to add in that rebuttal. Uh, it's got to be rebuttal. So you can have that presumption. You can yeah. But it's got to. You got to allow the rebut. Right. You got to allow the the truth to be told. You got to allow the evidence to mean something. And if that's the case, or in terms of say marijuana and other drugs, and then you can still have that in the law. I don't see how it benefits society at all to win. To, to make it not work. Yeah. It doesn't benefit society at all because it has nothing to do with maintaining the drug Yeah. And society, I agree, society benefits greater from individualized determinations. That's what we lawyers are all about. We want an individualized determination for our client and our client's day of court based on our evidence. I agree with you. Yes. I mean, my biggest thing with this was that I was frustrated um, seeing this because, like, someone could be doing hardcore drugs, like, heroin almost stays in your system for one to four days. Okay. So you can be shooting up all you want, and as long as the last time you shot up was one to four days ago, you get injured. Yeah. You're perfectly fine. You're going to get paid. Wow. Wow. Who smokes weed, which I guarantee less people die from smoking marijuana. Than people shooting up heroin. Yeah. The people who are smoking marijuana are going to be affected way more than the people doing heroin in a workers' comp case. Yeah. 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 Different different drugs, different effects. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those are all good points. Another good point is Castellanos versus Next Door Company, which we don't have to cover in as much detail because it stands for the same proposition that we just saw in Hall versus Ricci America. So over here in Castellanos, oh, I didn't even bother throwing it in the book. Where I threw it in was uh, notes and questions to consider. Number six, that's how important it was. 
buried in number six. I'm on page 531 of the notes and questions to consider for Hall versus Reach America. Note six says, the issue of conclusive or irrebuttable presumptions as addressed in Hall versus Reach America was also one of the topics of the Florida Supreme Court holding in Castellanos versus Next Door Company. That was a Florida Supreme Court decision in 2016 where the court struck down a mandatory fee schedule in a fee-shifting statute. What the court said there was, regardless of the facts of the case, this is the fee you got. That's nice if the case was a no-brainer, a couple of phone calls. That was terrible if the court case dragged on for years and consumed half your day, every work day, for a couple of years. Castellanos versus Next Door Company holds that that's an irrebuttable presumption and protects we lawyers from such an irrebuttable or conclusive presumption. Now we lawyers are entitled to an individualized determination as to the award of our fee. Yeah, I like it when the lawyer wins. My website is defendinglawyers.com for a reason. I root for lawyers. <laughs> so I'm rooting for you. And while I'm rooting for you, the syllabus promises to start but not finish access to courts. And that's how it's going to be. We're going to start, but we're not going to finish it. <laughs> so <laughs> access to courts talks about creating a right to a remedy, a right to a remedy. Generally speaking, if you've been wrong, does the fact that you've been wrong mean that you're entitled to a remedy? And the answer in American jurisprudence is no. The mere fact that you've suffered damages is not in and of itself enough to state a cause of action. In order to be granted relief, you must state a cause of action and prove each element of that cause of action. That's how you're entitled to a remedy. The right of access to courts expands upon that limited right to a remedy. And how does it do that? We're quoting now from Article 1, that's our Declaration of Rights in the Constitution of the State of Florida, specifically Section 21, which talks about access to courts, and it reads as follows. The court shall be open to every person for redress of any injury, and justice shall be administered without sale, denial, or delay. I hear what you're saying. McGinley, I studied federal law. I'm aware of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I know that there must be physical access to the courthouse. And to the extent, God bless you, to the extent that that is part of Article 1, Section 21, I would suggest in my law review article that that would be the procedural part of access to courts. What I want to focus on first is the substantive part of access to courts. It comes from an old document, Magna Carta. There at Runnymede, there was drafted language, which became part of no fewer than 39 states' constitutions, but did not become a part of the federal constitution. At least 39 states have one of these open courts or remedies clauses in their state constitutions. These remedy provisions have resulted in a myriad of interpretations by state courts. In the past few decades, for example, injured parties have used state remedy provisions to challenge tort reform legislation, such as workers' compensation acts, such as statutory caps on medical malpractice damages. And here I'm quoting from the University of Kansas Law Review that you see on the big board. A state's constitution access to courts clause is often at the epicenter of the historic power struggle between legislatures and courts, says Jonathan Hoffman in his Rutgers Law Review article. What are all these law review articles alluding at? They're alluding at a substantive right, more than just the procedural right. This is more than just the state constitution's enshrinement of the Americans with Disabilities Act. This has to do with whether or not you can abolish an existing cause of action. Under certain circumstances, under Florida's constitution, you may not abolish an existing cause of action. That's 
how Article 1, Section 21, despite its rather plain and simple language, has been interpreted to mean this constitutional mandate, which has appeared in every revision of the state constitution since 1838, has no counterpart in the federal constitution and derives its scope and meaning solely from Florida case law. The poll star decision, which we will talk about in greater detail in our next class, is Kluger versus White. This is a 1973 decision from the state of Florida. If you're to know any case by name for my final exam and for the Florida bar exam, you'll want to know by name Florida Supreme Court's 1973 decision in Kluger versus White. Because unlike many of the things we've studied where the texts of the Constitution is the answer. It is the holding of Kluger versus White that is the answer. Kluger versus White greatly expands and creates a constitutional right by citing to Article 1, Section 21, language that isn't readily apparent in Article 1, Section 21. What I mean by that is this. If you were to summarize the holding of Kluger versus White, you could do it in many ways, but I would do it this way. First, if the cause of action existed prior to the 1968 Florida Constitution, why 1968? You remember from earlier in our lecture, that was the last time we had a constitutional revision commission. That was the last time Floridians literally tore up the old constitution and created and enacted a new one. So if there was a cause of action that existed prior to the current constitution, then abolishing that cause of action violates Article 1, Section 21's access to courts under the Florida constitution. But there are exceptions. There are two exceptions. You can meet either exception. One exception has one prong. The other exception has two prongs. The first exception, you can abolish it if you provide a reasonable alternative. And again, this is con law, reasonable, rational, rational relationship, very low standard. That's option one. Option two has two prongs. Option two is there's both an overpowering public necessity and no alternative method of meeting that public necessity. So that's how I personally would summarize the holding of Kluger versus White. We're gonna go over the facts and we're gonna go over Kluger versus White again in greater detail in our next lecture. But for now, notice that I didn't put a typo in the slide. There's two number threes for a reason, trying to emphasize that you, can, you don't have to meet both of the unlesses, you can only meet one or the other. If a cause of action existed prior to the 1968 Florida Constitution, then it's a protected cause of action. How is it protected? It's protected from abolishment. You can tweak it. You can mess with it. You just can't abolish it. If you do abolish it, you got to meet one of these two exceptions. Either there's a reasonable alternative or there's both an overpowering public necessity and no alternative method of meeting that public necessity. I know you want to spend at least two more classes on this topic. Request granted. I'll see you in one week. Until then, may God continue to bless us all. Thank you for being here.